Thank you very much, Steph. Um, well, uh, first, of course, I want to thank the organizers and in particular, Catherine, for inviting me to, to join this um, really great event. As uh, Steph said, um, and for those who don't know me, I spent 20 years of my scientific life in Roscoff, 20, 20, 20, 20. <laughs> and, and so, um, honestly, it's a little bit like being back home. And so I'm, I'm very honored to have been invited uh, to this celebration. And as a tribute uh, to Esbear, um, of course, I'm going to um, uh, present you and talk about a research topic dealing with uh, marine introduced species and their interactions with the ocean sprawl. But um, for this tribute and this celebration, I, I choose to uh, use only case studies from my research that were done in Roscoff and with all the people from Roscoff. Um, so, um, a, a few words about uh, the context. So, of course, uh, marine construction have been um, existing for a very long time. And you have here two illustrations of two famous uh, seaports, among the oldest one, at least for uh, the Alexandria port. And uh, on, the, on the right, uh, Portus, the ancient harbor of, of Rome. But, um, in the last centuries and the last decades, um, built uh, structures have been developing at increasing rates. And as a proliferation of this marine construction, uh, human uh, built infrastructure at sea had been named the Ocean Sprawl, originally by Carlos Duarte. And um, in this Ocean Sprawl, in this proliferation of marine structure, harbors, uh, ports, marinas, are major contributors. Um, they represent roughly 25% of all marine, uh, of the impact um, of all marine uh, construction. And this ocean sprawl is a major driver of um, marine uh, biodiversity changes. And something which is perhaps not um, known very well is that actually uh, the impact is heard directly like through the destruction of natural habitats, or indirectly, um, for example, because of noise pollution or light at night pollution, have an impact on a surface which is comparable to the surface of urban land on, on, on the earth, on the continent. And, and you have here um, two pictures showing you um, a focus on commercial ports and marinas, which are already spread all over the world, so uh, which have impacts on, on every seas. And um, so this ocean sprawl is a driver of biodiversity change, but there is also another one that I know quite well, because this is uh, the, really the focus of my studies in, in Roscoff in particular, which is species introduction. And like for the marine construction, uh, the, the rate of uh, species introduction has been also increasing in the recent past, and particularly through the 20th century. And you have here the total number of uh, the marine species that have been introduced in European seas, which at the time of this assessment was roughly uh, 1,400. Well, this is actually a little bit less we know now. But anyway, it's a significant number of species that have been introduced. And these introductions are stemming from globalization of trade, commercial traffic, Com um, um, shipping, commercial shipping, and aquaculture in particular. But really shipping, ships, is um, the, the major vector of introduction at a global, regional, and local scale. And it concerns every kind of ships. Um, of course, for a long, very long distance dispersal, the cargo, and we had a very nice example with uh, the um, transmissible cancer that was presented yesterday by uh, Nicola. Uh, but um, uh, for this long distance transport, military ships, research vessels also for a, a long time. And at more um, regional or local scale, other kind of ships can play a major role, uh, ferries, but also leisure boating, which has been neglected for, for years. 
and actually they are probably the most important vectors of spread of this introduction uh, introduced species. So for um, and and yes, of course, uh, all these sports and marinas are building a very dense network and of human driven dispersal at local, regional, and global scale. And you can see here this map showing the, the trajectories of uh, every ship at a global scale. So um, f with this uh, background, it's, it's, it becomes quite obvious that ports should be very important targets when you are interested in either monitoring non-native species in, uh, uh, in new areas, and also um, should be used at the playground for the study of marine biological invasions processes. And this is what I would like to illustrate with three questions. Um, first, what is the contribution of non-native species to ports communities? A second question, um, do non-native species escape from ports to natural habitats? And are ports combined with non-native species drivers of evolutionary changes? So let's start with the first question, what is the contribution of non-native species to um, ports communities? Uh, to answer this question, uh, we, we first started um, in, uh, in the framework of a fantastic um, interreg project, uh, which involved many people at the station and which was called Marine Exus uh, 15 years ago. And uh, for the specific question of the presence of non-native species in, in ports and here in Marinas, we carried out, uh, uh, and I should say, uh, sorry, that this Marine Exus project was made in close collaboration with um, the Marine Biological Association of Plymouth. Um, and in particular for this part, we have John Bishop, who is here. And, and so John learned me and learned the, the staff here how to carry rapid assessment surveys as part of this project. And uh, we, we, we looked, we, we used this protocol um, to make a rapid uh, assessment of the species present in marinas um, occurring on both sides of the Western English Channel. And as you can see in this graph, um, we uh, recorded, and this is a black line, a substantial percentage of non-native species in all these places um, for uh, Cecil fauna. And it could reach up to 30% of the species for some taxonomic groups. Uh, we continue um, this, um, but the problem with the rapid assessment survey and, and more generally speaking with all the, um, the morphological uh, based approach is uh, the time and resources uh, that are needed uh, because you are examining specimens one by one and uh, we, we, we had to examine thousands of specimens and also you, it requires quite a, a bit of taxonomic expertise which is unfortunately declining. Um, and so for, for all these reasons, uh, we decided to, 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 to test for another way to examine the non-native species contribution by using a metabarcoding approach, so use of a DNA retrieved from environmental samples like water samples, and the DNA extracted from these water samples is sequenced, and, um, and the sequences that are produced are compared with databases for which there is a link between the species name and the reference uh, and, and the sequence. And so we try to, to see, um, to evaluate the effectiveness of this approach for non-native uh, species monitoring uh, surveys. And, and so uh, in parallel to this metabarcoding approach, we still used uh, quadrat surveys, so uh, the divers of the station were scrapping specimens under the floating pontons, and then many people uh, spent hours to sort every specimens that were scrapped, and uh, we tried to provide a name in, in the field. And, um, and, and so we carried out this comparison between metabarcoding and quadrat surveys in all these marinas located around the coast of Brittany. And it was done as part of the PhD of Marjorie. Um, uh, we defended uh, her thesis just before he, she and me left the station. 
Um, and so the results, um, there are many results from this thesis, but just to show you, to continue on the same idea of the, the contribution of non-native species to port communities, you have here in, in, this pan, in these four panels a comparison between the results obtained with uh, metabarcoding on water samples and uh, results from the quadrat survey, and you can see here the results for one quadrat, and it met 20 per, per, uh, per port. And, um, and for two seasons, fall and spring, and in the, um, the 10 marinas that we were studying. And the pink color is for the non-native species. And it totally confirmed the observation we made uh, 10 years before, um, and by both methods, that the contribution of non-native species is quite spectacular, it's substantial. And again, it was on Cecil fauna and four, four um, classes uh, of Cecil animals. So, um, uh, and as a side question, considering this number of introduced species, we were interested in to, to, to know if this uh, community uh, finally was quite singular as compared to the wild. And so in the Bay of Morley, we compared what was in the port of Blosco uh, with uh, natural sites in the bay. And as you can see, and again, it's with the quadrat surveys and with the meta coding, we had a very clear distinction between the marina and uh, the sites which were in natural habitats. So it, 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 it was quite clear from that result that the, 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 the port community is singular. So regarding this first question, um, yes, harbors are clearly uh, introduction of spots, but not only introduction of spots, the species are still uh, remain there, and and so finally uh, they display singular communities. And as a side um, result, and meta barcoding it, it seems to be quite effective for monitoring non-native species. <coughs> so. Um, okay, the, the communities are singular, but does that mean that uh, non-native species never escape from arbors? Uh, and to answer and, and illustrate the, an answer to this question, I will use uh, another case study. Uh, Philip um, talked about it um, during his presentation yesterday, uh, which is wakame, uh, undaya pinatifida. We had a very interesting story in France because it has been introduced accidentally um, in the Toll Lagoon in the early 70s, but then was deliberately transported into Brittany to be cultivated in pilot farms. And uh, very rapidly, Jean Floch and its colleague showed that less than one year afterwards, the, the species escaped from farming areas to established uh, populations, notably on artificial structure. And the situation, so this map is quite old now, it's five years ago, um, uh, you have a distribution of, of Undaya pinatifida, um, which, um, which is occurring in three categories of habitats. Of course, in the farms where it, it is still cultivated. Um, in Rakai reefs, but the, the most important habitat for this species appears to be marina, where it is common, abundant, and, and it's colonizing uh, every marina. Um, and the colonization is, can be very fast. We had the opportunity to, to, to follow the construction of the newly built marina in, in Roscoff, the Blosco Marina, from the very, very beginning. And, um, and over time of the construction, we followed the colonization because we were sure that Undaya would come. The colonization in the port over time, over three years. Um, the, the first pontoons were set up in, in 2013. And we, we actually noticed in February 2013 that a, a leisure boat was carrying um, uh, Undaya Pinatifida on, on its hull. And, and the, the year after, February 2014, we observed the first individual set up on the infrastructure. And then you have the course over time, and you have this snowball effect, which is very impressive, of a rapid spread and colonization. And actually, what is funny, what we, it was assisted also with genetic studies. I don't have time to present the result. But what is interesting is that the first really colonizer of the infrastructure was partly funded by those individuals the parents were the individuals on, on, on this ship. So considering all these uh, different um, uh, remarks, 
Um, and the fact that Undaria can be really uh, dispersed on, on ship hulls, either uh, when it's visible, the macroscopic stage, the uh, sporophyte, but also at the microscopic stage, the gametophyte, for example, in the rups. Um, we were interested to know to which extent Marinas contributes now to the population established in the wide, because we did survey in parallel, and you, most often the colonization first arrived apparently in Marina and then after in the reefs. But we wanted to be sure in the relationship between these two habitats, and so we carried out as part of the IDEALC project, which was coordinated by Philippe Potin, and Philippe presented you the, this project. Um, a, a, a study where we sample pairs of trios of marina and natural habitat populations, plus for two bays we had forms, and we did a, a genotyping procedure based on the analysis of 10,000 SNPs derived from rat sequencing. And um, to summarize the result, uh, the first is summarized on this graph, which is showing the genetic backgrounds which is shared or similar or dissimilar between the population. And you have the pair of um, Marina, Rocky Reef, Marina, Rocky Reef, Marina, Rocky Reef, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so it, it's quite obvious that um, it's, uh, the population from the Marina and the Rocky Reef are very, very, very similar as the same. And so that, with other evidence from field work, uh, support the fact that there is a spillover from the marinas to uh, the natural uh, habitats, but not a spillover from farms which show quite distinctive patterns. And, um, and so there, there had been a change in the functioning and settlement of these species at a regional scale over time. The, the first was really an escape from farms, but over time, the influence of marina predominated over farms for the establishment of the introduced species into, uh, into the wild. The second uh, observation from this data set is, is that um, there is a kind of mosaic genetic structure at the regional level. And in particular, we have genetic similarity between um, very, among very different locations, which are much uh, um, higher than the natural dispersal ability of the species, which is very poor. And, and these... Um, Yes, be patient. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, this one first. Um, and this um, highlights the fact that there is long dispersal. There are long dispersal events, and and so most likely with leisure boating. And this uh, long dispersal events with leisure boating is not specific to Undaria. It has been shown in other species, particularly um, which, which can be also native or cosmopolitan species, like uh, the native species Cyana intestinalis or uh, the, the colonial tunicates Botulus chaucery, which shows exactly the same kind of pattern. And, and so the dispersal by leisure boating is something very important, which creates this uh, mon mosaic genetic structure, and, and particularly that helps to provide connectivity shortcuts um, for short dispersals. Um, and, and so for this question, um, of course, you remember the, the singularity I showed between marina and natural habitats. The port communities are singular, but some not, some non-native species can escape sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so in some cases, they are documented uh, spillover from ports uh, to natural habitats. So far, still rarely documented, and we don't have idea of uh, how important is the process actually, because there are not enough studies uh, of this uh, of this kind. But again, and I insist because it's really important, this connectivity shortcuts that change really the trajectory, um, dispersal trajectory of the species. So now I come to the, the last point. Uh, what about evolutionary changes in, in these sports and in relation to, to the presence of non-native species? And here I, I will make a focus on a particular evolutionary process, which is hybridization and integration. And, um, and, and why focusing on hybridization? Uh, simply because, uh, because of the transport of uh, the species on ships, uh, you have uh, something very special that is happening, which is a secondary contact in ports between species that have been previously in allopetry and which would have never been into contact without 
this human dispersal. For example, species that were that are native to Pacific and that are now in the Western English Channel. And so they have been separated for a very long time, sometimes probably a million of years. And, and so it creates particular conditions of coexistence, of secondary contact between um, species that uh, should not be into contact. And, and so there are diverse outcomes that are predicted with such situation. Of course, they can coexist. Or they can have, you can have some um, competitive exclusions that is occurring, either because uh, the native overcome the, the, the introduced species or the reverse. And finally, if the species are not reproductively isolated, you can have an admixture process, an introduction, a gene flow between those species that are in secondary contact. And so to illustrate these uh, processes, um, I will now focus on one of my favorite pets, uh, which is um, the, the Sayona or Robusta and Sayona intestinalis species. Um, the, um, which is exemplifying this kind of secondary contact between species that have been previously in allopatry. Um, Sayona robusta is native to Asia um, and has been introduced in the uh, probably very, very recently end of the 1990s or early 2000s um, in the, uh, the distribution range of Sayona intestinalis and notably in the English Channel and also the Bay of Biscay. And so they, they are in contact along all this area. And um, so we were interested to know what, what is going on. And so the, this work started with the thesis of Sarah, who, uh, who again sorted thousands of Sayona and uh, for examining them, uh, stating, uh, assessing if they are the introduced or the native, et cetera, et cetera, picking up uh, tissue samples, a huge, huge work. And as part of her thesis, she also um, carried out um, uh, a genome-wide study based on, on uh, 300 SNPs uh, derived from transcriptome analysis and um, sequencing arena sec And the two species were actually shown to coexist without gene flow in the contact zone. And this is summarized in this graph. Um, we had samples from all the contact zone and also samples used as a control where the two species are not into contact. And in this graph, you can clearly show that all the individuals, uh, Sayona intestinalis, are grouped together, whatever their origin, in the contact zone or not. The Sayona robusta are all grouped together, and they are very well separated on the axis one of this PCA. And in the middle, you have three dots. Two are first generation hybrids that were experimentally produced here in Roscoff, crossing them because they are actually interfetal in lab. And you have a single blue dot, which is one individual with a maternal lineage of Sayona intestinalis, but with an intermediate position, and thus a first generation hybrid. So what was observed is that, of course, there is one, but there is one over hundreds of other individuals. And Sarah Mac made another study with thousands of individuals, and again, it was only one first generation hybrid. And none intermediate ones, so no back rows, no second generation hybrid. So at this stage, our conclusion, and we were really sure about that conclusion, <laughs> as was, uh, well, they are coexisting. Uh, at least now, perhaps one will exclude the other in the future, but they are coexisting and nothing is happening. Well, some um, we are wrong. And so, and we knew that we were wrong with a further study um, where we examined a much, much, much higher of markers, taking advantage both of rat sequencing, but also uh, full genome resequencing of uh, Sayona individuals that were produced uh, in labs. And, um, and, and, um, and thanks to that, we, we had very different uh, perspective. And the work was done by Alan. Um, I know that Alan will, will come here soon, so uh, it's good. And um, uh, Alan Lemont and uh, Christelle Fries. And, um, and so uh, both, uh, the, the, the two studies uh, highlight uh, a number of results. Of course, 
globally, it's the same. The, the species seems to be distinct, very distinct. But um, we actually observed in a single chromosome out of the 14 of this species, and in a single region of this single chromosome, a fragment of Sayona robusta allelis that is in Sayona intestinalis. So it was a proof of an introgression of Sayona robusta allelis into Sayona intestinalis individual. So the, 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 the introduced species provide uh, some of its alleles to uh, the native species. And it's very localized. And uh, there are many reasons, and uh, Christelle did a lot of analysis, very sophisticated, uh, sophisticated analysis, to prove that it's, um, um, it's uh, probably uh, likely adaptive, uh, although it's not yet fixed in the population, so the, the introgression is present in different population of the contact zone. Um, uh, the, the, the violin uh, part of the spy charts are the, the, is the proportion of individuals of Sayona intestinalis which show uh, introgression. So it's, um, it's not uh, present in every population, it's in variable frequency, but still. Uh, Christel showed that there are many evidence for um, positive selection and um, for uh, an adaptation um, uh, conferred by this introgression. And um, the first, uh, well, th there are things to, to pursue, of course, but we have uh, very good candidates for, uh, to think about an adaptive process, notably because it's in this uh, area. Uh, we have um, uh, Cytochrome P1450 uh, uh, gene, which, um, and the family uh, is involved in detoxication process, which could make sense in important environment. And, um, and actually, in introgressed individual of Sion antitestinalis, there are um, a repeat, um, there is amplification of the copy of this uh, gene, exactly like in, in Sion robusta. Which and this uh, repeat uh, of uh, of copies is, uh, is not found in, in individuals that are not introgressed. So uh, we think to have here the um, good evidence supporting what is named an adaptive introgression, which is very rare in marine environments, and and we now we, we plan to, to to investigate that in more details. So um, and I, I choose this example, but. For sure, um, there are many ways also where uh, the interaction between ports and non-native species can drive evolutionary changes. And, um, and so uh, we, we really believe uh, that uh, ports are very singular habitats, uh, notably because there is this, um, these non-native species which play a major role. So ports um, are singular habitats because there are a series of abiotic stressors that you are well aware of, like pollutants, artificial substrate, etc. There is this particular role of non-native species contribution and the presence of this secondary contact. And, um, and also uh, the fact that the species found in ports also have particular characteristics. And these ports are replicated situations. They are forming a network of novel habitats, ports being the nodes of the network uh, linked by shipping activities. And all this set of conditions create perfect conditions for a series of evolutionary outcomes. Adaptive process, uh, these co short connectivity shortcuts, uh, these um, introgression processes, etc. And so uh, we, we strongly believe that these uh, ports are a perfect arena for a new urban rendezvous along the seashore. Um, resisting, resulting, of course, in many also, I didn't present that, but ecological consequences and then also evolutionary consequences. And I will take, Steph, just one minute. <laughs> no, I, I, know, I know the time. Just because um, I, I would like really to, to thank very, very warmly um, all the um, scientific, technical, and also administrative staff of the station um, all these guys really make these uh, studies possible, and, and so uh, I really wanted to, to take the time to, to thank them very warmly. Well, and of course, happy birthday, Roscoff, and uh, long life. <laughs> thank you.
Thank, thank you, uh, Frédéric. We have time for one or two questions. It's a birthday party, so we have time. <laughs> Thank you, Frederic, for this nice uh, presentation. Um, I, I'm not very aware of this type of uh, uh, um, analysis, but is your example um, with this uh, meta barcoding or this uh, uh, marker that you first had and th the own, the first yeah, the first part, um, an, uh, an example that we need to be careful with uh, markers that we use, wh where you had this first conclusion from a thesis of the hybridization, ah, you, this you, one. So you mean the third part of the talk yes. with the hybridization. It means that with the density of markers, increasing the density. You, yeah, okay. <laughs> it, it means that in the first study, we used 300 SNPs that were designed a little bit everywhere from the genome. But actually, as the intrusion, what is left from the, the hybridization between these two species is very localized. Yes. Very, very localized. It's only by increasing the marker density that we could, that see, you could it. see it. But does this mean, I mean, is this the only type of hybridization that it will be very localized? No, no, no. no, no. It can be no. any case. I did not have the time, but uh, for uh, Nicola and, and uh, his former PhD student, Alexi, for example, uh, studied a very interesting case study um, which um, with Metilus uh, species and an introduction of Metilus galloprovincialis, the Mediterranean uh, lineage, um, into uh, the, the big ports of uh, the English Channel, North Sea, etc. And, um, and they showed an hybridization with the local Mytilus sedulis um, species. And in that case, it's a very different outcome. So in that case, it's a homogeneous and mixture between the two lineages. And if I say something wrong, uh, Nicola, help. <laughs> and uh, and it's something very, very homogeneous. And in that case, uh, even with less, uh, more, uh, little number of markers, you can detect it. Uh, is it something very short? Could it be uh, an horizontal transfer from uh, viruses? From the no, it's, it's too large. No, the, the really the, 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 the sequence, the fragment is really cyanide robusta. So there is a perfect identity. Okay. But it's a long fragment. That's why not cut. It's a long fragment. So thank you, Fred. Uh, I think it's time for. Thank you.